let's should we start with seven uh, we talked or at least did six and seven is similar right um, so what's the first thing we need to do on seven um, well we need to isn't it something that we we have to separate x minus one we on a over x minus one plus b over x squared minus one um we need to factor that denominator okay <clears throat> factoring it by um the difference of perfect cubes okay in other words when you factor the difference of perfect cubes what you get is that times And that is an irreducible quadratic factor. In other words, okay. that will not factor down any further. So, and of course, I have the numerator. So, what's this going to be equal to? Um, it'll be equal to a over x minus 1 plus b over x squared plus x plus 1. Because we have that irreducible quadratic, you have to put an x in the numerator. Okay. Like that. Okay. That's when we have to do it. it, is only if we have an irreducible quadratic. We have the same thing right there in number six, and we had to also have a bx plus c. Right. Okay. So now when we move this equal sign a little bit to the left, so let's see, we have a times x squared plus x plus 1 plus bx plus c times x minus 1. And all of that's equal to the numerator on the other side. Okay. In other words, we've taken the denominator out of it at this point. Right. What's the next step? The next step would be to factor in the A and B and C's. Not factoring them. Multiplying them. Well, multiply them in. In other words, distribute the A. Okay. So that gives you a, and the reason is, is that we want to gather all terms that have the same degree of x. Okay. Now you're going to multiply these two by foiling them. Okay. What do you get? You get bx squared minus a bx. And then plus cx X minus c. c. Okay. Now gather all like terms together and factor out the variable. Okay. So um, that would... So, okay, so ax squared... Um, would we factor out the... Yeah, what, what you're going to do is you're going to combine that term with that term. So we're going to have A plus B, or AX squared plus BX squared. Okay. And then we're going to factor out the X squared, 
leaving A plus B as its coefficient. Okay. Okay. In other words, we know the left side has an X squared term. Right. And now we know that A plus B has to equal 1. Right. Okay. So let's do it with the rest of the terms. What's the X term going to be? The X term would be X times A minus B. Now let's see. We got an A minus B plus we got a C. Oh, so A minus B plus C. Yeah. And then the two constants are A and minus C. Right. The only reason I put them in parentheses, don't need the parentheses, but it's nice to think of, okay, now we're going to use a concept of equating the coefficients. Right. So over here on the left, what can I write? The left? Wouldn't we I'm just write, write it the... On the left because it's the only place I have room. And I'm okay. going to write it in blue, but what's the next thing I'm going to write when I equate the coefficients? Are we adding the coefficients a together? B, a plus B has to equal what? In other words, this coefficient has to equate to the coefficient of the X squared term on the other side. Okay. Which is 1. With me? Yeah. So what does A minus B plus C have to equal? Um, that would have to equal 3. Good. And what does A minus C have to equal? Uh, negative one. Negative one, correct. All right, so we got three equations, three unknowns. We're going to be able to solve for A, B, and C. And then we're going to be able to do the problem. Now, let's see if there's a quick and dirty method of doing this. Um, let me think for a second here. Um... Well, let's see. I'm going to do this the hard way. I'm going to add 1 to 2 to get rid of C. And then right. it's going to give me 2A minus B equals 2. Okay. And now I have this equation up here that says A plus B equals 1. Now I can add those two together, and I get 3A equals 3, A equals 1. We'll write that solution over there. If A equals 1, what is B equal to? A equals 1, B would equal... Equation at the top left. B would equal zero. And if A equals one, C has to be what? Uh, C has to be two. I think so, yeah. So there's our three numbers. So now I'm going to put that there. I'm going to put that there. And I'm going to put that there. Okay. Now let's rewrite it and see if we can integrate it. Let me make some room. Hope I didn't make a mistake because I can't go back to it. I think I didn't. So, I'm, this time, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to spend the time to check this to make sure that it's correct. Okay. But normally I would. If, if, my life depended on it, 
then uh, I would do that. Right. Um, because there's so many different mistakes you can make. Uh, so that thing decomposes to what? What's the right side become? Two over x squared plus x plus one. Mm -hmm. Hi. So, so we're just now, integrating that? the integral of both of them. So this one's relatively easy. Yeah, just ln x minus one. And then the other one, I would pull the two out first just to make it simple. Then what? And then we do u substitution. No. In order for u substitution to work, you've got to have the derivative of the inside, usually in the numerator. Oh, the yeah, that's true. Of the well, inside would be 2x plus 1. Right. So then maybe, are we undoing the power rule or chain rule? Can't can't use the power rule because the power rule depends on that derivative being somewhere. Right. So right off hand, I can only think of one technique that works that I can think of, and that's completing the square. Huh. And then you use some sort of an inverse trig function. And it's hard. You haven't learned any of that, have you? I have not. You, you have not learned how to integrate by completing the square? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, that's not a common thing to learn. Um, that's probably the next step after learning how to integrate by partial fractions. Right. And oh, then I'll... It's a trig substitution. Uh, after. Right. And then on Sunday, on Sunday... That's my last, um, I think it's my last session before my class, like, la my last cl class test. Uh-huh. But, but then um, I'll have a couple more sessions before the AP test. Okay. Uh, let me just kind of introduce you to how you would complete the square. Okay. Um, I'm not even sure I remember exactly how to do it. Let me erase that for the moment. Let's just talk about this integral right here. Oh, incidentally, I meant to tell you a funny story. Have you seen the movie Hidden Figures? I have not. You should watch it. You're going to okay. chuckle. Out okay. of it. It's a true story. But it was really? about when they sent man to the moon, they couldn't solve the math of the trajectories. Wow. And the lead guy says, yeah, this math hasn't been invented yet. And then about... <laughs> An hour later in the movie, the, the protagonist, the lady mathematician, comes to him. She says, I got a solution. We're yeah. going to use Riemann, not Riemann, uh, Euler's approximation to solve these differential equations that we don't know how to solve. In other words, you can get some really, really complicated differential equations, and they didn't know how to solve it. And so what That's they awesome. went to was Euler's method. That's funny. That's cool. Remember Euler's method? That was one of the first things you kind of hit me with, and I didn't know how to do it. I actually lost a calculus student because that was the very first thing she talked about on day one, and I didn't know how to do it. Um, right. Well, I, st I stuck with you because I knew you'd learn it. Well, I did read. There were a couple pages in it, and, and I uh, I did figure it out. But I, I laughed my ass off when I was watching this movie, and they said they resorted to an ancient method because they didn't have the current math to do it. That's funny. That is kind of funny. But anyway, okay, let's talk about what I have circled over here. Uh, and let's put a one on it because you, you said that you can always bring that in. So what we're going to do is we're going to complete the square of 
Notice I haven't changed anything. Right. Now I can write it as 1 over x plus 1 half quantity squared plus 3 quarters. And now we're looking at a format very similar to Arctan. Right. And I don't remember exactly what you have to do from here. Um, well, I think... Convert that to a 1. So I won't waste any more time on it since it's been so long since I've had to do it. I don't remember how to do it exactly. Okay. But that's basically the concept. And you can kind yeah, of see how you're getting closer and closer to one of those arc trig functions. Right. All right. Let's go forward here, uh, agreeing that we don't know how to do that last integral. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see what else. That's the last of this page. Let me close this out. Put it over here. And open this one up. Evaluate the following integrals. Okay. So <clears throat> these are easy. You just got to make them. Make sure you don't make a mistake. Now, right, maybe they're so. not so easy. Maybe I'm speaking before attempting. I noticed some right. infinities here, but that's okay. They don't really bother me that much. I just treat it like a number and substitute it. Right. So I'm gonna. So what's the first one? I'm going to rewrite it as x to the negative one half dx. So then it would be, so we're increasing the power by one. So it's x to the one half times two. And then evaluated from zero to one, which I can do the evaluation. Okay. Then, Second one. Um, so if I'm so for the second one, mm -hmm. if I bring that power from the bottom up, does it flip or does it stay the same? No, it's, it's just negative. It's exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. However, I think we're gonna see a problem when we actually do this evaluation. First of all, what is that? That is what. Uh, that is x to the one-third times one-third, so three. Times three. Times three. You meant divided uh, by one-third, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. So three x to the one-third and then evaluated at negative one to one. Well, I thought we might run into a problem, but we don't. In other words, you can't take the square root of negative one. That would be right. a problem. But so but you can that. for you can for the cube root, right? Yes. Any odd roots you can take of all real numbers. Okay. So then three. Times all minus. Well, minus. Um, oh, you were going to say times one. Okay. Yeah. All well, right. I was going to write it like that. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so, yeah, three times one minus negative one to the one third would be negative one. So, minus three. In other words, two negative signs, so that's six. Right, so then six. Okay. Now, if that would have ended up being the one half, I think we have to maybe solve that problem by going from zero to one, multiplying it by two. Okay. I don't know. I wish they had one on there like that to see whether that works. I think that's what you have to do in that situation. 
because uh, you can't evaluate a negative number. And if it ended up being to the one half, that is an even function, meaning that it is symmetrical about the y-axis, and that is when you can go from zero to one and double it. Right. In other words, if I've got that, and I want to find the area from minus 1 to 1, then I can go from 0 to 1 and double it, because I know that that's an even function. Right. Hmm. It's actually an interesting question. I don't know that I can necessarily do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, take that back. I don't think you're going to see a problem like that, where they force you to uh, give you a limit of integration that violates the domain. I feel yeah. like I'm at number. You could do that. You could do that for um. Uh, what's it called? Do it for a regular quadratic, not a square root function. Yeah. Maybe it's just x squared. If you wanted, I mean, I don't know why you would. Well, there is no area under the curve. In other words, the curve I just drew, which was the square root function, right, um, has no area under the curve from minus 1 to 0. Right. So if you were asked to integrate it from minus 1 to 0, I'm thinking that the answer would just be from 0 to 1, and you have to ignore the non-existent area from minus 1 to 0. Right. Um, but I don't know. The, anyway, let's talk about okay. three. What's the integral of e to the x? It's e to the x. Now, then, for me, the easiest way to do this is just substitute it, and you you can figure out what e to the infinity is or e to the negative infinity. So right, and e to the zero is one. Minus e to the negative infinity. Which is? That would go to, that would go to zero. Yes, that is 1 over e to the infinity. This goes to infinity, so the whole thing goes to zero. Right, so then that would be 1 would be the answer. Correct. Which is kind of interesting if you think about it. I mean the e to the x function looks like this. And what they're saying is, is that all the way to infinity from negative infinity up to zero, that whole area is exactly one. <laughs> right. That's crazy. It is kind of crazy. It's like those infinite series. In other words, it's like when we say you know, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth. If you do that all out, that's equal to one also. And yet, if right. you make it one half plus one third plus one fourth, it goes to infinity. <laughs> Not even close to one. So. Right. All right. Yeah. Let's see what else do we have on this page. <laughs> this one would be ln of 1 minus x. Mm, hold on a minute. Take the derivative of that. What do you get? Negative 1. Oh, so negative ln. Or, yeah. In other words, if I took the derivative of this, I would get 1 over 1 minus x times they tried to minus trick, 1. They tried to trick me. In other words, I'd really get 1 over x minus 1. Right. And that's not so what we have. We have 1 minus x, so I think we just need a negative sign. They tried to trick me because, like, on the test... If it's written 1 over x minus 1, you just do ln of x, x minus 1. No, the, the derivative of the inside is a plus 1. You don't worry about it. 
Right, so then they're just one minus fully... x. The derivative of that is minus one. So, right. um, so what did we figure out here? I, I'm still uh, negative ln one minus x. Negative ln one minus x, which means the same as one minus x to the minus one, because that's just a in other words, I can go up and make it the exponent. Right. Which means ln of 1 over 1 minus x. Which is weird, isn't it? It's very weird. Because what it means is negative ln of 1 minus x is the same as ln of 1 minus 1 over 1 minus x. Right. I've seen these kind of weird things happen before with logs, though, um, where you get really strange results, like the derivative of the log of 2x is the same as the derivative of the log of 3x or the de derivative of the log of x. Right. Um, and so maybe this is a similar thing to that. Uh, I believe it is. And now is all we have to do is evaluate it. Ooh, now this is where it's going to get tricky. Can I take logs of negative numbers? And that's why when you integrate it, your answer has absolute value signs on it. Right. So, that being the case, is this the answer? Um, log of one-third minus, uh-oh, we got real problems when we substitute one for x. What? Would it be possible for the integral to just diverge? That's infinity. 1 over 1 minus 1 is infinity. Right. Would it be possible for the integral to just diverge, like, as your answer? It appears like it does, because we have a number, negative number, minus infinity, so that does diverge. Okay. Um, Would that be the answer of that integral? Well, wish we had time. I'd graph this, and we'd look at the area from one to one, one to four, and I'll bet it's finite. So I'm a little confused. Um, ah, maybe it's not finite. That's hyperbolic in nature. And it's, I believe, a hyperbola like this, the second and fourth quadrants. So if I'm wanting the area from 1 to 4, it's that area right there. That can't be infinite. Ah, ah, might be infinite because there's a horizontal translation here. I didn't graph that right. Ah, in fact, that curve has pretty sure that it's translated one to the right. And so that parabola, or rather that hyperbola, now goes like this. And that's one. And that's four, so the area goes all the way down to infinity, and that could diverge. Right. Right? Right. You, you never come across Gabriel's horn? I got to go because I have a 730, but I, you got you to gotta tell me. Have you come across Gabriel's horn yet? I don't think I've heard that term. Oh, man, look it up. It will blow your mind. By rotating 1 over x over the x-axis and integrating it out to infinity, you end up with something called Gabriel's horn that has a finite volume and an infinite surface area. 
What? Wow. Okay. Digest that for a minute. That's all you got to do is rotate 1 over x over the x-axis, go out to infinity, and you end up with something that looks like a horn, right? They call it Gabriel's horn. And it's got a finite right. volume, but it's got an infinite surface area. Wow, that's... Which means it could not hold enough paint to paint itself. Yeah, it's a paradox. It's called, uh, it, there's a lot of paradoxes in math when you get to some of those uh, shapes, like Gabriel's. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't seem possible, but no, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. That's why it blew my mind the first time I heard about it. You should look okay. it up. You'd understand, you, you would understand enough of the math to understand why it's true. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, I'll talk to you next time, John. Okay, thank you.